God bless you. We bring you greetings in the most holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can get swiftly into the word for today. Amen. We're going back to the message, parable. Parable, praise God. And uh, it's very obvious when you look at how Jesus, uh, in illustration, gave us the definition of parables. Because a parable, if you see how Christ used it and how he applied it, is just taking stories. But true stories, life stories even, and revealing truth, and in some cases, revealing prophecy. So you can see how he took stories. There was true stories because he, he can only speak the truth. There is no way that Jesus can give you anything that's fiction because he is the truth. Everything that comes forth from him is truth. So it's not like make-believe stories like Disney uh, World and they, you got to try to find some truth in some type of fiction type situation as we do. But Jesus being the truth and, and being that, uh, being God in the flesh, he cannot lie. As Paul wrote in the book of Titus, the first chapter said, God who cannot lie promise us, promise eternal life before the world begin. Praise God. He can't lie. God, and then the book of Hebrews said that he's immutable, he's unchangeable, it's impossible for God to lie. That's why if he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, it shall surely come to pass because he cannot lie. Then uh, in the book of Numbers, uh, the writings of Moses, you see that Balaam talks about how that uh, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. See, man can lie. And one scripture said the man is born lying up, coming from the womb. The man is, man is easy for a man to lie, but God can lie. That's one thing about his character. He cannot lie. So when he speak, he must speak truth. If he said there was a certain man, there was a certain man, praise God. <laughs> Whatever he tells you is actual, is truthful, is not make-believe, praise God. He gave real stories. As he gave a story about a rich man, there was a rich man and there was a poor man named Lazarus. That was a true thing. That actually happened. Everything he gives is truth. But he was revealing some truth to us and revealing a story about two individuals that both had to face their eternity. One spent his eternity, amen, in a place of torment. So that was a true reality. That actually happened. And the other one spent his eternity in comfort and in peace and tranquility. Two individuals. One happened to be rich. Doesn't mean being rich means that, that you're not going to go to heaven. But in this case, this rich man didn't go. Praise God. Uh, but the poor man, and being poor doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven. But this poor man ended up at the right place. Amen. So it wasn't because of their social status that determined their destiny. It was their relationship with God that determined their destiny, where they both ended up at. So the poor man had a relationship with God. He was in right standing with God. So that's why he ended up at the right place, though he had a hard life. The rich man wasn't in right standing with God, though he had a very, very easy life. In this life, he ends up in a place of torment. Just want to point that out to you. That was a true story. Everything that comes out of Christ's mouth has been truth. Everything that came out of his mouth, rather. All that you read about is not fairy tale. The reason why I had to bring that out because there's a group out here that, would, that described parables as make-believe stories that was used to illustrate truth. And they, uh, their doctrines are based on speaking against the truth that Christ revealed, saying that, well, it wasn't a true story. And when Christ has made up stories, it's illustrate a point. No, it wasn't like that. It was true stories. True stories. When he said, a soul went forth to soul, that was true. And not only true, it's actually, it happens every time when people do farm, that some seed falls not into the ground that they want to give uh, plant uh, 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 cause to germinate and plant. 
a plant life to form. Sometimes it falls on, on, on stony grounds. I've seen people trying to sow grass seeds, and the birds are eating more seeds than they were sown in the ground. Because that's just what happens. Some seed falls on stony ground. Some fall among the thorns. Then some fall on good ground, where it's going to germinate and grow. These are actual things that happen in, in everyday farming, actually. But Jesus was saying there was a, a sower. So when he said there was, there was. So I'm just saying that to declare that, because uh, now the reason why uh, this group tried to make every parable a make-believe story because they don't believe in eternal judgment. In other words, they don't believe there's a hell. This particular group of, of, uh, of religion doesn't believe there's a hell. So then when Jesus told the story about hell and about a man that went to hell, they said, oh, no, he just, that was just, you know, that wasn't a true story because it comes against their belief and what they want to believe. Now, you can create your own world if you want to, but you're going to have to deal with the real world at some point. And that's what happens to some people. They create their own world. They create their own way of thinking. And they come against the Bible. And it's not going to change God's word. It's not going to, as, as uh, the writer Paul wrote and said, shall their unbelief, shall their unbelief uh, 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 take away, in other words, from the word of God? No, it, it's not going to do that. So their unbelief, you know, he said, let every man be alive but let the word of God be true. So it's not going to make void God's word because they don't believe it. It's not going to have no effect on the truth. The truth is going to be fulfilled. Prophecy is going to come to pass. And even a lot of scientists is kind of like backing up and putting it in reverse because when a lot of the scientists that was atheists are becoming believers because they're looking back at the Bible now and seeing all the current events was foretold centuries and thousands of years before it came about. They're now going to the Bible for answers, a lot of your scientists. Because they can see everything that was written to come to pass. We're actually living in it in today, society. So they're seeing prophecy being fulfilled before their very eyes. So now they're taking a, a, another uh, viewpoint at, at uh, God's word. And there were scientists that was against, uh, you know, creation. Now it's taking another spin on it because they can see that there's a design in every point of creation. And where there's a design, there's a designer. Comes back to God. Comes back to God. And they come past the place where they believe that uh, in, the, in the Big Bang Theory where something just blows up and everything falls into formation. That never happened, never will happen. Go ahead and blow something up and see can you form something out of that. You can't. Creation have to be uh, something that's, that, that, that uh, there's someone behind it because things just don't fall in place like they do. Why is the moon uh, uh, at the distance that it is from the earth? Why is it that certain distance? If it was a couple of degrees closer, you know what would happen? All the water would come inland and we wouldn't have no land. Why is this, the, the moon uh, or the sun is set at a certain point that if it was a couple of degrees closer, the earth would be no more. You got to know that somebody's planned this. Somebody's planned this. Why is the atom a replica of the whole universe? You can see the smallest thing in creation represents the largest scale of creation. Why are all these designs and patterns? Because someone was, a, was involved in that, and that was our creator. So scientists are coming to terms with themselves, a lot of them, a lot of them. They're stepping out of the world they wanted or the make-believe make world they had formed and coming back to reality, that things are very, very much present before their eyes, evidence of a creator. His handprints are everywhere. Praise God. You can tell that creation, there's a creator by looking at God's creation. So anyway, looking at the parables, people want to light, uh, uh, make light of the parables and, and dismiss a lot of things that Christ said, but everything that Christ says is truth. He is the truth and nothing but the truth. And even John in his epistles, when he spoke about Jesus, he called him the truth. He said, for the truth's sake that, that dwelleth with us and shall be 
in us forever. Talking about Christ. Jesus is the truth. Praise God. And when Pilate stood before Jesus and Jesus told Pilate, uh, he that her of me, her of the truth. Praise God. He's letting Pilate know you, you're talking the truth in shoe leather. Praise God. The truth is standing before you. The essence, the fullness of is standing before you. Praise God. So looking at the parables, Jesus being who he is, only can speak truth, take to heart every, every thing he gave us in these parables. True stories, true illustrations of life. And then out of it comes the mysteries of God. Out of it comes prophecies being given all within this, these parables. Yes, let's, let's go to it, uh, the, the ninth chapter, I mean the ninth verse of the 13th chapter, yes. Matthew chapter 13, verse 9. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. Oh, you know what, i tell you what, let's, I may have gave you the wrong verse. I want to go to the um, 13 and... I believe I want I want the verse where the apostle is asking the question, why do you speak in parables? It was after. 33. And that'll be no actually no, you was at the right verse. Mm -hmm. Let's take nine and ten together. Okay. Go ahead. Re read you can read down again, yes. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. Yes. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speaketh thou unto them in parables? So he explains this to them because the parables again as we spoke last week, it comes because when God is dealing with one that doesn't have a relationship with him, the word would not be given to them clearly. It will be given to them in a mystery. But once they submit their life to Christ, then the mysteries of God is given to them. Because God wants to have a relationship with you before he reveals his hidden things to you. It's like, a, like any relationship. You know, when you get closer to people, they start telling you all the things about them that nobody really knows. They just reveal all. They tell all because you got close. Or now you have a friendship. Now they can share with you uh, some things that they're not going to tell everybody else. Well, God is the same way. There's some things God is not going to tell everybody, but he's going to tell those that have submitted their life to him. The true followers of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus spoke parables to those that were not disciples. But when he got back with those that were disciples, he explained everything to them. So now, uh, let's, let's, let's go into verse um, 34 and 35. Yes. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. Because he's dealing with people that's not disciples, and this is the way he dealt with those that were not disciples. He spoke parables unto them. But then he's going to, we're going to see an explanation why, why uh, he's speaking in parables. Because the apostles wanted to know why you're speaking in parables. And so he had to answer that. As you go on here in this chapter, uh, Jesus uh, tells them that uh, that they that see may see not and they hear, hear not. There's a place where he talks about that. But the thing of it is, the parables is given to them because they're not really disciples. Bottom line is that God's not going to reveal his secrets unto no one but his servants. That's the bottom line. But at the same time, before Christ came on the scene, the, uh, the Old Testament revealed what his style of teaching would be. See, it was already revealed that Christ would speak in parables before he was even conceived in the womb of Mary. He's only fulfilling prophecy by speaking in parables. Because the Bible explains in, into detail about Christ's uh, his coming, how he, everything about him, how he would preach, how he would teach, everything about him was revealed. So this was a part of his style of teaching. He always taught in parables. But the scripture foretold this before it happened. Go ahead and read the next verse. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret 
from the foundation of the world. Now, this was spoken before Christ was even born and conceived in the womb, before he came forth as a man. So the prophecy concerning Christ was that he would open his mouth in parables, and he's going to reveal secrets that was hidden from the foundations. Praise God. So let's, uh, let's move over to... Um, John chapter 9, nine. verse 39. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, For judgment I come into this world that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be, might be made blind. So then he's talking about blinding them. So a part of the parables was to blind them. To blind them. And this is, when I say them, it's talking about those that, that was not willing followers of Jesus Christ. But it happened to be Israel. The people he's speaking to now is the nation of Israel. Prophecy has already been given that they will be blinded. But he's blinding them with truth. Because when people decide not to follow Christ, the truth blinds them. They can't see the truth. They can't perceive the truth. They can't embrace the truth because they're not followers. So let's look at um, the uh, 12th chapter of, of John, 37, verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Who is the them? The them is Israel. The them is Israel. Remember he said at one place, I came... Uh, not but unto the house of Israel. When in fact, he told the, the disciples, he said, when you go forth, don't, don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go the way of the Samaritans, but go to the lost house. Go to the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go to them. So he was sent. His mission, first of all, was to address a nation, which was Israel. And so it's talking about the responses of the majority. Now, he had some believers out of them. A very small group of people followed and believed. But the mass majority of the nation did not. So here is telling you their, their responses. Read that verse again. But though he had done so many miracles, because them, yet they believed not on him. Though they seen all these miracles, it wasn't enough to make them follow him. Don't think a miracle is going to determine whether someone follows because it's a heart thing. If a person purpose in their heart not to serve the Lord, no matter what you do, it's not going to deter them from their decision. If they want to uh, live for the devil and they want everything this life has to offer and they don't want to sacrifice to follow Christ, even a miracle would not convince them to follow. So though he did all these miracles, still they did not believe but there was a prophet that already seen the moment before it came. He seen Jesus coming and he seen the responses of the people before Jesus even came. Let's keep reading. We're going to read about this prophet. In that the saying of Esaias. And Esaias, because when they translate uh, Hebrew to Greek, you get Esaias. When they translate, uh, when you translate then from uh from Hebrew to English, you get Isaiah. It's a little different. So we're going from Greek to English, right? From Greek to English, you end up with Isaiah. From Hebrew to English, you end up with Isaiah when you look at the Old Testament. So you know how it works. The Old Testament is, is a translation from the Hebrew for us to English. The New Testament is a translation from the English, I mean, from the Greek to the English. So you got Greek and Hebrew, Greek, uh, Hebrew for the Old Testament, you got the Greek for the new. So when you get translations, you get the name differences. We're still talking about Isaiah of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's called Isaiah's. Now, what did Isaiah say? That the saying of Isaiah's, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake the Lord. Who has believed our report? And to whom have, has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, this is why Isaiah had to say, because he's seen in a vision, he's seen them rejecting Christ. He said, who has believed our report? Because he don't see nobody believing. And to whom has the arm of the Lord or the Messiah been revealed? Who has believed? He's saying that for a reason. Because Isaiah 
is he has tunnel vision. He can see down this, the telescope of time. He can see, praise God, that, that later on Messiah Jesus will be on the scene and he, was, he could see his rejection. And so he's looking at a nation that's hearing the message of the Messiah, hearing from the Messiah, and as he sees, he sees the rejection and he says, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord or the Messiah been revealed? Keep going. Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah said again. Now, he's, now Isaiah is speaking again, or Isaiah is speaking again because he's still looking. He's still seeing. Praise God. He see a crowd. He see a group. He see the nation of Israel rejecting their Messiah. So he speaks again. And go ahead. He has blinded their eyes. How did he blind them with truth? That's why he's speaking in parables. He's imparting blindness unto them by truth. Because when a heart is hardened towards God, the truth will blind them. It's like shining a light. You know, when you see somebody in the dark, someone's in the darkness, and you turn the light on, it shrinks their eyes a little bit because they've been in the dark for so long. So then the light blinds them, and the light is the truth. It blinds them because they've been in the dark for so long. That when the light hit their eyes, they go, oh, that. oh my God, what was that? See, truth just hit them. But their heart is not ready for that truth. Because they're not ready for a commitment. They're not ready for the submission. They're not ready for a surrender. So then the truth then blinds them. This is how God blinds them. The parables with the truth. Go ahead. And hearten their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and well, I should heal them. Well, the thing of it is, once one decides uh, that uh, they're not going to serve the Lord, then their heart's going to be hardened. But the truth comes, and the truth blinds them. And the truth hardens their heart. And it's saying that when we say the truth is hardening their heart, we're really saying in essence that when the truth comes, they reject it. And then their heart becomes a stone. Though it say God is blinded, God is hardened. How did God hard? How did God blind? Just by telling them the truth. By Jesus showing up on the scene saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Rejection comes. Hearts are hardened. By Jesus saying, I'm your only way out. They decide we're going to go another way. Eyes are blinded. Eyes are blinded. Yes. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake on him. See, when he saw in his vision, when he saw Jesus coming on the scene, he seen the, re the rejection that would follow. And how did Jesus blind them? When he gave the parables, he was imparting blindness unto them because they was rejecting as fast as he was giving. So why was the parables given? The apostles want to know why? To impart blindness unto them. Why was it given? So that prophecy could be fulfilled because prophecy said, amen, that he's going to open up, up his mouth and speak secrets or mysteries that was kept back from the foundation of the world. Now he's going to speak of things. But doesn't mean they're going to receive it. Praise God. Because revelation come doesn't mean people embrace it. You go tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. Don't mean they're going to follow. You got groups of people. One group that I, I, I keep talking about this group. Because I just want to throw their name out there. But if I describe enough you're going to know what I'm talking about. But this one group that's out there to tell you that, that they're Christians but they don't worship Jesus. They're Christians, but they don't serve Jesus. Then you know you're disqualified right there. Because if you serve, if you're gonna, if you if you're a Christian, you gotta both serve and worship Jesus. How are you gonna be a Christian? You must be following someone else's teachings and not the teachings that came from Christ. When he was born at his birth, the Bible said that that that, that a heavenly host began to worship. And then one scripture said, amen, and let all the angels worship him. 
And that's exactly what they did. And then the, uh, the wise men that came, they said, we come to worship him that's born king of the Jews. Worship began from the time he stepped on planet Earth. You're supposed to worship the king, which is Jesus. But when you worship him, you know that the Old Testament said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thy serve. So he must be God in the flesh, because the scriptures say you're supposed to worship God. And him only shall you serve. And Jesus telling people, Amen, if any man serve me, uh oh, you must be God in the flesh. If any man serve me, if any man follow me, he said, Let him serve me. And if any man serve me, him will my father honor. So people not understanding when they heard the word of God, uh, a lot of lack of understanding comes from the degrees of darkness in people's hearts. Their decision is against God will cause them to not understand very things that's written in scripture. They can't understand it. God made it that way. If your heart is not perfect towards him, meaning that you don't want to serve him, the word of God is just a mystery to you. And you're going to say, I can't see that. I don't accept that. You probably won't because you're not ready to surrender. You probably won't. You may want the best of both worlds. You may want a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of the world. Well, then you're going to get none of Jesus that way because the Lord ain't going to play uh, second place to no one. You have to let take him on, amen, as first in your life or he'll never be in your life. You can't put them up on the shelf and just uh, think about them on Sunday. You got, you got to, if you worship and serve the Lord, you got to serve them straight through the seven days of your week. That's true surrender. Amen? Well, I'll wait to Sunday and live, live uh, like a heathen all week long, and then when Sunday comes, then y'all, sudden you're going to jump holy. But it ain't going to work that way. Amen? It got to be straight, too. Amen. That's true uh, servitude. Yes, have you finished uh, up that yet? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move over to uh, Romans. Romans, yes. Romans chapter. chapter 11, verse 25. Yes. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own con consents. Deceit, yes. Yeah. Consent, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. That blindness in part is happened to Israel and to the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now watch this. Blindness had been imparted. When Jesus stood before the people, he was imparting blindness. Remember in the ninth chapter of John, he said he came that those that see may be blind. He was imparting blindness. As Paul is saying right here, say blindness have been imparted unto Israel and to the nations and to the fullness of the Gentiles. Coming, the Gentiles represent the nations. And to the church is born, and to the church is formed, and to the church is manifest, and to the church, praise God, comes into fruition, and to the church is actually manifest in the earth. And when we come to the end of the church age, then maybe the scales will fall from their eyes. Praise God. And to the fullness of the Gentiles is really talking about the church. And to the church comes to, to fruition. And to the church is manifest. And to the church has come to the end of its age. Blindness has been imparted unto them as a people. Now there's going to always be a selective few. That's going to see out of uh, the Jewish family. And we do have that. Even now we have what people that call them, that Christians that call themselves Messianic Jews. But the mass majority, that's a small fraction out of the mass majority. That's not even 1% of the mass majority. The mass majority is going to miss it. Go to Tel Aviv and Tel Aviv is looking for a Messiah because they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Blindness have been imparted unto them. When you go to the Holy Lands, as a lot of Christians call it, where it sounds like it's the 4th of July over there, I don't know how holy the land is at this point. Because <laughs> you ride through, you, it's like you're going through a, a, a battlefield. I mean, bombs are blowing up consistently. 
Everything is happening over there. But the, the so-called holy land or the term we use holy land is to get your money so you can go over there and spend money with them and say that you've been to the holy land. Holy land. <laughs> but in essence, say nothing holy about the land at this point. Because they have rejected Jesus. That's why the land is not holy. Because they don't see Jesus as Messiah. So the land is not holy. Until they recognize Jesus as Messiah, that's not the holy land. Right now, they don't recognize Jesus as Messiah. And Paul referred to them as the Jerusalem that is, is in bondage now with their children. He said they was in bondage. You're, and we call them the people of God. They're Christians. They're called the Jewish people, the people of God. Why are you rejecting Christ? You can't be called the people of God. Until you recognize that Jesus is Messiah, you are not the people of God. But if I call you what John the Baptist called you and what Jesus called you, I'll call you a generation of vipers. <laughs> Anybody rejects the Messiah, you got, that's, what they, that's what they was called by, by John the Baptist. John called them a generation of vipers. He told them, say, don't come down here calling yourself the seed of Abraham. God is able to take these rocks and raise up children unto Abraham. So you may call them the people of God, but you're not the people of God until you accept Jesus as Messiah. Being Jewish doesn't make you the people of God. But being a, a disciple of Jesus Christ makes you the people of God. Be it Jew or Gentile, if you follow Jesus, you are the people of God. So don't call those that reject Jesus the people of God because they happen to be Jewish. We're going to the Holy Land be, uh, over there with the people of God. We're going, you, you messed up twice. They're not the people of God and the land is not holy because they have rejected Jesus. Amen? When they receive Jesus, we might consider if the land is holy. Now, I know that it holds history. I know that it, 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 we can go back and see the tomb where Jesus laid, and, and we can see other monumental spots that took place in biblical history. And so because of that, you want to call it holy, but it's not holy until Christ is reverence and regarded as Messiah. It is not holy. Praise God. So let's keep reading. Yes. Matthew chapter 21, starting at verse 28. Now, I want to look. We're coming back to the parables. Jesus in the parables. Now, we looked at how blindness is imparted unto Israel until the Gentiles, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. This is really talking about the church age. The church must come and the church must have the time of its fulfillment, meaning that the church will be taken out of the earth. When the church is taken out of the earth, caught up to meet Jesus uh, in the sky, as the Bible tells us in the book of Thessalonians, says that we shall be caught up to meet him uh, in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord at that point. The church age have ended. It have ended. And then you have come to what we call the fullness of the Gentiles. Then we move into another era. You go to the book of Revelations, you can see where the fullness comes into place. You see the church standing before the throne of God in the seventh chapter. And they're worshiping. But at the time they're standing before the throne of God, the Bible talks about how there was 144,000 that were sealed. Now we're stepping into another era. Praise God. Another era in that seventh chapter of Revelations, you see that. So, consider when the Bible says blindness have been imparted, it's for a period. It's until the church comes to its end. When the church comes to the end of its age, praise God, blindness until then have been imparted. They be still over the a wailing wall, you know, doing like this, and the, you know, you know, the wailing wall where they be so-called they throwing tears and whatever against that wall. Amen. Looking for a Messiah. They've already come. And because they're looking for a Messiah, not considering Jesus as the Messiah, guess who's going to pop up? They're going to get a Messiah. Jesus said there's going to be one that's going to come in his own name. 
And him you will receive. He's talking about the Antichrist. He's going to come as the Messiah for Israel. You keep looking. He's coming. The wrong one is coming. The wrong one is coming because the other one is already passed. Jesus is already come and gone. The true Messiah. They're waiting for a Messiah. And there's one that's going to come, going to be a Messiah to Israel, going to be a world leader to the world. He's going to be the answer to the world. And on Israel's part, it's going to be their answer because they're going to see him as Messiah. That's why they're going to make a covenant with him for a week because how they see him and perceive him to be. But he's not. He's not. He's not. Yes, go ahead to the parables. Verse 28. But what think ye, a certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards, he re repented and went. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Now watch this. Jesus is speaking to them about this parable for a reason because Jesus is pointing two things out to them. There's two sons. These two sons happen to be the church, and the other one is Israel. Those that represent the church was at, at a time where they said no to God, but now they're saying yes. Israel is saying Yes, but still don't do whatever they say they would do here. In other words, you got these two sons, Jew and Gentile. These two sons. And Jesus is pointing out this for a reason because there's something about to happen that they're not prepared for because God is about to turn his eyes away from them. And the church is going to be born. This is where we move towards God so loved the world because he's looking at the church now. God so loved the world. Israel turned his back on God. God turns his back on Israel. And now God's eyes are upon the nations, upon the world. And he's about to bring in a son. We become a son collectively at that point. He's about to bring in the church. Keep reading, daughter. Rather of them, Twan did the will of his father. They yeah. say unto him the first. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him and ye when he had seen it repented not afterwards that ye might believe him hear another parable there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to the husbandmen and went into a far country. Now, what I want to do is, because we're not going to read it all, skip down to verse 43, the last verse. Yes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Now watch this. See, these two parables is talking about Israel and the church. And you're going to see it here. So he said, now, after telling these parables, they get to the heart of what we've been talking about all along. The kingdom is going to be taken from you guys. I want you to read that whole verse. Go ahead. I'm going to stop you. Go ahead. Therefore, I, therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. This is the church. Now, the church is called a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation so the, uh, it's going to come a time the kingdom is going to be taken from you and given to a nation which is the church that's going to bring forth the fruit that i couldn't get out of you guys why you guys are rejecting me i'm gonna bring forth a group of people that you never expect to rise up to the occasion they're gonna be your used to be harlots used to be drunks used to be all these things but now they're in the kingdom of God. 
praise the name of God. I'm going to get those that you consider low life, even as the Jews thought of the other nations as dogs. I'm going to get these dogs that you guys see as dogs in your mind, but they're going to become the people of God. And then Hosea seen us coming. Hosea said, where it was a time that they was called not the people, where they were not a people, they should now be called the people of God. Because Jesus said, I'm going to take the, the kingdom from you, and I'm going to give it to another. A nation that shall bring forth, amen, fruit unto me. So he's seeing two groups of people, and he's calling them sons. A man had two sons. The one said no, and then later he repented and did it. The other said yes, but did not do, which was Israel. Israel was good with lip service. They was good with being hearers of the word, but never doers. They was good at ceremonies and rituals, but from their heart, they could never serve God. So God said, I'm going to take it from you, praise God. I'm going to give it to those that you despise. Those that you don't even want in your company. Those that you don't even want to even come under your roof. Because in that time, uh, even back in the times of Christ, a, a Jew would never step in the, under the roof of a Gentile. But that's going to be my people, though. The people that were not a people. It's going to become the people of God. All this is revealed in his parables. He's revealing things that was kept back from the foundations. They didn't see this coming. But Jesus is revealing it. Now let's, let's close out in the eighth chapter of um, Matthew ver verses 10 through 12. See, Jesus oftentimes talked about the church and the coming of the church. And also where uh, Israel would lose out. They would lose out because through their rejection, God had to turn towards and look to turn towards the world and look for the birth of the church, which would be people from all the nations uh, that was despised one time of Israel that would become the people of God. But God would take the many nations, save them from all the different nations and make them one nation, the holy nation. The holy nation that we read about in, in uh, Peter, uh, the, I believe it's uh, second chapter in, in the first and the ninth verse of, of first Peter, where he talks about this holy nation. Yes, let's read this. We're going to close out on this. Verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that follow, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No and that's what's going to be found in the church. The Gentiles are going to bring forth the faith that Israel couldn't bring forth. The Bible even called Israel in the book of Deuteronomy people without faith. But heck, come the Gentiles showing up full of faith. And Jesus is looking at this. I'm about to cut you guys loose. Praise the name of God. I'm about to get those that's in love with me, crazy about me, want to serve me. I want to get those that's, that's ecstatic about, praise God, serving and worshiping me. I want to get those folk as my people. The Gentiles was always excited about Jesus. They was always excited about him. But the Jews couldn't really connect. And here's a Gentile. Jesus is experiencing all this rejection from his own people, the Jewish people. Here's a, a, a Gentile, Roman, coming up and saying to Jesus, listen, you don't have to even come under my roof. I have a sick servant. Speak the word only. And my servant shall be healed. And then he looks back at Israel. I have not found so faith. No, not in Israel. But I'm looking for it, though. I'm looking for this faith. And it's going to come from the church. It's going to come from the Gentile. Praise God. The ones that's been rejected straight through the Old Testament, but now become the people of God. Hallelujah. Keep reading, daughter. Keep reading. You can take it, pick, it, pick it up from 10. Okay. Yeah. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that follow, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now watch this. Those coming from the east and the west is really talking about Gentiles. But they're going to get the picture after he finished this statement. Man, I tell you, many shall come. Talking about the Gentiles are going to come running after me. They're going to come from the east and from the west. They're going to come to serve me. They're going to come to worship me, to bow down before me. They're coming. 
to do what you guys can't do. They're coming. And what's going to happen when they come? Yes. Keep reading. But the children of the kingdom shall Who be cast out. Who are the out. children of the kingdom at this time? Israel. Who has a covenant with God at this time? Israel. So they're called the children of the kingdom because of that. They're in covenant relationship, but in, in reality, they're disconnected from God. And so he calls them the children of the kingdom shall be what? The children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gashing of the teeth. Not only I'm going to separate some, y'all guys going to hell. <laughs> huh? You're not only going to be cut off, hmm? but there's a place awaiting you. You know why he really told the story about the rich man and Lazarus? Because they both was Jews. And at that time, they didn't believe the Jews would go to hell. And Jesus told them a true story. There's a Jew that ended up in hell. And what did that Jew do when he, get, when he ended up in hell? He called Abraham father. He said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus. That's why he called him father. Because that's how the Jews addressed Abraham. The Jews felt like they was the seed of Abraham. So then Abraham becomes their father. So out of his Jewish heritage, he speaks to Abraham and calls him father. Father Abraham, send Lazarus to tick, just dip his finger in some water to cool my tongue because I'm in, I'm in torment in these flames. And then he went on to tell him, say, and, 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 and if... You could get to my brothers. I got five brothers that they don't come to this place. And then Abraham said, uh, they got Moses and the prophets. He said, but no, no, Father Abraham, if one came back from the dead and told them, meaning let Lazarus come back from the dead. If Elijah could go back and tell these people, they would follow. And Abraham said, if they don't hear the prophets, that mean the word of God then neither would they hear from one that, though he came back from the dead. And Jesus was giving them what was going to happen. He's going to come back from the dead. And they still won't be able to hear. Jesus resurrected from the dead and Tel Aviv is still unsaved. As a people. He came back from the dead. Did I convince? Because they had challenged any miracle and said it never happened. That's what unbelief would do. It challenges. When miracles happen, it challenges. It says it can't be real. That's what unbelief would do. Unbelief doesn't embrace miracles, signs, and wonders. They challenge them. That's what unbelief would do. So Jesus let them know, listen, they're going to be people coming from the east and the west, and these is God's people that are Gentiles. They're going to be the church. And they're going to set with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the children of the kingdom, looking at Israel, they will be cast into outer darkness. And they shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth because it's a place of torment. That's why they shall be weeping. See, Jesus speaking to Israel as he's speaking to them. Letting them know there's, there's people coming. There's a church coming. There's a nation coming. Praise God. But you guys, it's going to be taken away from you. You wasn't able to appreciate what God done for you. So it's going to be taken away from you and given to a nation. Praise God. And we're that nation. And Moses seen us coming. When he seen the church coming, Moses said, with a foolish nation, shall I provoke you? And we, we're supposed to be the ones that provoke them to jealousy. And it calls us a foolish nation because we was fools before we came to them. <laughs> we came out of situations where we lived a fool before we surrendered our life to Jesus. Hmm? And Moses seen us come and say, well, foolish nation shall I provoke you. I'm going to provoke you to jealousy. I'm bringing forth somebody that's going to be just like the centurion that can believe God. 
that can come with the faith and the quality of faith that God's looking for. As you see in the centurion in the Roman Gentile soldier coming to Jesus. And Jesus is going to see that the church is going to be Gentile. That's why the Bible talks about the fullness of the Gentile. The majority of the church will be Gentile. We're going to have some Jews there. But they're very small fraction in comparison to all the Gentiles that's coming to know Jesus. And then in another place it says, in his name shall the Gentiles trust. I believe that's in um, uh, the 12th chapter of Matthew, verses 20, 21. 21 is the actual verse that says, in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Looking at the church being born, in his name shall the Gentiles trust. We thank the Lord for his word. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is unto you and unto your children and unto those that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. God bless you.